I count on you in a way. When people tell me, oh, this is worse than the Civil War. Blood on the streets. I've never seen anything like August 4th. It turned into a jungle. To me, the Thauro was, it was an inspiring period in history. The meat Alf Lira is worth less than a dollar. Being Lebanese in the United States, it was very hard to understand what was going on here. Any opportunity to speak to you, George Azar, in person, whether we're walking in AUB, uh, in nightlife, when we cross paths, at friends performing music, on my own podcast, roughly three and a half years ago or so, or today. I can't think of a better person to offer perspective. And the reason I say this is, I'm, be I'm getting older, and I'm beginning to appreciate more what your generation did for this younger generation. And I think I'm increasingly inspired by your lens. And the reason I say this is because without you knowing this, I often look back at wartime photography to reimagine this country during the 1980s, in particular during the Israeli invasion and the aftermath. And I always cross I always download and access your photos, not just yours, but I lean on your point of view because increasingly over time, I'm beginning to feel that our current collapse and our ongoing paralysis resembles a bit of the downward spiral Lebanon faced during the war, minus the checkpoints, minus snipers, minus mounds of earth, minus the green line, but this feeling of nothing is in our control, I count on you in a way. And that's maybe applying too much pressure on you from the beginning, but I really mean it. There are only a few photojournalists that I can think of that told the story accurately, honestly, with a Lebanese view, but also not necessarily entirely Lebanese because you came to this country and your career, if you will, began here, but you weren't here before. So all of that, to me, is a way of introducing someone who's complicated, layered in history, layered in identity, and lives here by choice. So you're a photojournalist. You're lecturing media at AUB. You're a documenta documentary filmmaker. And you have a fantastic Al Jazeera episode a witness episode about your return to Beirut in 2012. I highly recommend that one because it's really your, it's where this story in a way is right now. It's a return. So is anything what I just said right now, this long introduction, does that resonate with you? And that do you feel something familiar? Is there something that's hearkening back to those years? Or am I overdoing it? In other words, this has nothing to do with the 1980s. We're living something fundamentally different, and it's just me applying pressure <laughs> on a gentleman, because really inside my bones I feel it. And I, w I was wondering if you feel the same way. I mean, in some ways, it's similar. I mean, this is a real time of crisis. This is a time of historic crisis. This is another episode of our history where everyday people are disempowered, where they don't really have control over their day-to-day -day lives and you know, the value of the currency, you know, whether there's electricity in their house, whether they can afford to feed their kids. Um, yeah, so it's similar in that sense. It's a, a, a real time of crisis, of deep, deep crisis. That said, when people tell me, oh, this is worse than the Civil War, I always think to myself, you don't remember the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> that was a true horror. That was a true horror. Um, because now, although there is a kind of social violence, there's a kind of emotional violence that goes on, there's a violation of people's dignity, there isn't the real violence, the face-to-face -face violence, the killing and blood in the street. We don't have to worry as we walk down the street whether a car is going to explode. Mm -hmm. And we're not terrorized in the same way. So there are similarities, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't really compare it to the Civil War or, or the war years. Um, Let me posit it differently. 
aftermath of the port blast. The last time we spoke on a podcast was, I think, just as the October uprising began, October 17 protests. We were at AUB talking about a student-led moment and a youth-led moment, and we were rather positive in our assessment of where things were moving. The port blast and its aftermath, does that type of devastation take you back to those years? Or do you still think of that as something that's detached, that that's, that maybe is not as, I don't know what the word is, it's, it has less to do with civil war, more to do with corruption. Because I'm trying to factor in when I see new damage, new violence, and blood on the streets, I go back to those photos of the 1980s, and I see familiarity. So is there anything you could maybe, am I applying a perspective that's incorrect, or is there something there in terms of repetition? I mean, I have to say, you know, I've seen war here in Lebanon. I've been to Afghanistan. I've been to Iraq. I've been to Gaza. I have never, I was on the Iran-Iraq war front. I've never seen anything like August 4th. I have never seen anything like that. And it all happened in a moment. It wasn't, you know, destruction that has accumulated over years or over months. Mm. It happened in a moment. That, to me, was astonishing, mm. jaw-dropping. And at the same time, it was a trauma that was sort of felt by the entire city. So it was something that people shared. And that was extraordinary. It wasn't one side of the city bombing the other side. Right. Um, it was different. It was a shared experience. I remember for you know weeks walking around, and you'd see somebody that you hadn't you know seen in a while, even if a stranger. You'd say Alhamdulillah salami. You know, everybody yeah. had been traumatized. It's like the entire city had experienced the same car accident together. That was extraordinary. As was. To me, the response of the people. Mm. I mean, as terrible as it was, the fact that an army of young people appeared with shovels and brooms and went from door to door helping people, asking if they were okay, cleaning out their houses, making sure they were okay, and then going on to the next one. I mean, the same kids that had been partying till 2 a.m. on that <laughs> street, you know, the right. weekend before. Yeah. The social outpouring and the solidarity, to me, was one of my big takeaways. It's like, there is hope for this country. You know, there is real human decency here. There is real human kindness. There is care for one's neighbors. Um, that to me was extraordinary. And actually when people talk about the problems of Beirut and the fact that we have no electricity, I say the real extraordinary thing is that we do not have rampant crime and murder and rape the way you would in any other Western capital. I mean, the lights went out in New York City, I think it was 1968, and the entire place went crazy. People were looting, they were burning shops, they were assaulting people. It turned into a jungle. In Beirut, we deal with this all the time. And I know people don't like this word resilience, maybe it's the wrong word, but there is a real Lebanese spirit. There really is, and there is a as awful as we can be as a society, and we can be <laughs> truly awful, <laughs> you know, we'd be a medalist if there was an, an Olympic uh, category for this <laughs> in terms of awfulness as a society. There also is a real kindness and a real, I don't know, generosity for people in need. Is that something that you experienced regularly in the 1980s as a stringer for AP, as somebody that was on the ground for years on end, as somebody that witnessed horrifying experiences. And you, you reflect on those regularly. And that's why I emphasize witness on Al Jazeera because it is a back and forth of the Israeli invasion and what, what took you back to Lebanon later. But that kind of moment of real violence, real anarchy, did you sense that kind of resilience then when you were here? In other words, I like the way you're describing the largest non-nuclear blast in modern history hits Beirut and kids are on the streets cleaning up hours later. I'm thinking back to the 1980s. It's a chapter I don't know intimately. I was too young. Did you feel that Lebanese were that resilient all along? I'll tell you, the first time when I first landed here, 
I didn't know my way around the city very much. There was the green line. I was staying in Hamra. Uh, and you could hear tak, 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 tak all the time. And I wanted to be a news photographer, so I started walking towards the tak, tak, tak. <laughs> and I figured in my mind, okay, like with when I get to, you know, within, you know, a good distance from the front line, you know, people, uh, you know, I'll, I'll know because people will be sheltering and, and that sort of thing. I walked <laughs> directly up to the green line and 100 meters away from people shooting were people going about their everyday business. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> they were hanging clothes, they were going out. Uh, they had developed, a, you know, it had sort of become part of the, the everyday life. Mm. Whereas where I came from in California, if there was, you know, a shooting, they would block off entire city streets. You know, <laughs> they would the psychologists would come in to deal with the, the trauma of the children, and here, I mean, for better or for worse, people carried on. Right. Um, people carried on, and more than that, in some cases, they insisted on enjoying their lives and living their lives as best that they could which was is really different than, say, in a place like Palestine, where when a tragedy happens, it's common decency to close everything down for people, you know, not to appear in public. It would be bad taste to have a party. Um, here I found that, especially during the Civil War, the act of going out at night was a certain act of resistance. So yeah. even during the Civil War, you experienced, in a way, what you're talking about in terms of the post-blast recovery and then Jamezi's a nightlife district once more. That's kind of where I was going in terms of trying to see if there's familiarity. And you, you're absolutely right. It's not that there's bloodshed on the streets all the time. We can go in and out of Beirut. We can cross Beirut. We can go most of Lebanon without thinking about these things. But I just meant more in there's a fatalism or almost like a, there's absolutely no way out of this mess. And I always wondered if the 1980s felt that way here. You couldn't see the civil war ending or the Israeli occupation ending or the Syrian occupation ending, or for that matter, militias fighting each other. I was wondering if that was the same kind of feeling back then, albeit much more violent. I guess what I'm getting at is whether you felt paralyzed then in a way that re resonates with someone today feeling paralyzed. In a sense, yeah. I mean, that war went on for a long, 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 long time. Mm. And it didn't seem like there would be any end in sight. Mm. And there were so many ceasefires which would break down and the war would start up again. And then they would organize another ceasefire and it would break down. And the war would seem to come to an end. And then it would break out again. And there was a hopelessness. Yeah. I really didn't ever think that it would end. But what I see now is, in a way, I mean, just as disturbing, but slightly different, I see that after the Thaura, people seem to have lost hope that they can affect change in any way. Right. You know, there w to me, the Thaura was, it was an inspiring period in history. And, I, you know, being an optimist, I really thought, okay, maybe we can turn the page and make this, you know, a truly just democratic or something <laughs> like that functional society. And it couldn't have been more nonviolent. It right. couldn't have been, you know, more broadly based. It, it, you know, the message couldn't have been louder. And yet nothing happened. Not even, not even a symbolic token gesture. Not even a symbolic token gesture, nothing. And although the problem has continued, I think people are, I get the feeling they're deeply dispirited. Mm -hmm. And it's that loss of spirit, it's that loss of hope that I think is gutting. It is, and I had this conversation last night on my own podcast with Zaven Kuyumjian, who writes about this and has books that are meant to embrace the despair. And I find that hard to do, but I'm guessing over time, when you're in this country for decades on end, and these moments come and go, and things only get worse as time passes, 
I guess there is something there. But it has absolutely nothing to do with the credit of a somebody like him who writes collective memory. He collects photos from the Civil War. He does perspectives. He has a book called Lebanon Shot Twice, which is really the same locations, pre, sometimes pre-war, during the war, and then post-war. But he's done something new, which is he includes updated versions that include recent mm. tragedies. And that's where the repetition comes to mind. My earliest memories of this country are the Lira note and ribbons and rubber bands, the 50 Lira notes that you had to collect because it was worthless money. And I think back then the 250 was the largest note and it had just been printed. So that's my earliest memories of this country trying to put a lot of Lira into your wallet. That's what I feel like today, 140,000 Lira I mean, the meat alf lira is worth less than a dollar. So I guess maybe it's too simplistic to say it's the same thing, but I don't know. I, 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 I hearken back to the older generation's maybe way of expressing that pain back then. And I want to emphasize, and you, you hinted at it already, it's not just Lebanon. I mean, you've been, you've been all over the region. There's a, I mean, you're the author of, uh, Palestine, a phot photographic journey, which is your post-Lebanon experience, which is in itself quite remarkable. You leave this country during the worst years of fighting, and suddenly you're, co you're collecting <laughs> images of the Intifada. And I think that's also credit to you that you're able to do that. But I'd like to go a bit in your psyche, if I may. The decision to leave Lebanon in the 1980s, after having set foot in this country during a very dark time, covering the Israeli invasion, and then leaving. But leaving to cover other tragedies. Did you leave Lebanon because you were so hurt by this country that Palestine seemed less damaging? Or did you simply make a decision that you didn't want it to be a Lebanon-focused career, that you wanted to expand on that? Because you leave really at a time where I think many photojournalists would want to still be here covering endless tragedy, but you decide to go to another tragedy. So I'm, I'm simplifying it, but has Lebanon, the way you feel towards this country, has it shifted in ways that maybe are not always good, that you want to leave sometimes and reflect on this country by going to other tragedies? Or w why do you leave when it's, in a way, at its peak, for, for at least a photojournalist? No. I mean, first of all, it was never the tragedy that brought me here. Mm. Being Lebanese in the United States, it was very hard to understand what was going on here. It was not covered much in the news. Um, when I was very young, I thought, oh, well, it must be because there aren't reporters there. <laughs> 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 That's why it's not appearing in the press. Uh, so I <laughs> came and I started as a photojournalist, just at, intending to spend a year here. And then I, I began oh. working for the AP, and then later for Newsweek, and later for others. And I was here on and off throughout the 80s. But after a certain point, the senselessness just got to me. And the trauma just got to me, frankly. And I thought, these pictures are not changing the world. In right. fact, they're not. Working for the news services, especially the wire services, we, st we sort of specialized in what we call bang bang pictures, and so the the, the bang point bang as in bullets. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The point was to get you know the closest you could to the action, the most cinematic, you know, photographs of war and destruction and that sort of thing. And you know, after I at some point in my career, I looked back on it and I thought, I'm not helping people understand this place. I'm just adding to another layer of disinformation. I I need to step away from this. And so I went to the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper, and I was at the paper for a couple years, and uh, just you know, sort of doing regular assignments. I followed the Grateful Dead, you know, on tour in the United States, and you know, I had all kinds of other kinds of assignments. And I had been to Palestine in 1982 when I was captured by the Israeli army, and after they released me, I toured around the West Bank. And even though it was at a, a time of real national crisis for the Palestinian people, I didn't see one demonstration. I didn't see one flag. 
I didn't see <coughs> people standing and singing patriotic songs. And I, I was struck by the fact that the oppression was so heavy mm. and that these people were paralyzed. And when I was in the United States at the Inquirer, um, I saw that, you know, demonstrations and riots had broken out in Gaza. And I thought, well, that's great. Maybe it'll last for a day or two. And then it spread to Nablus. And then it spread to Khalil. And then it spread to Ramallah. And after a week, the entire country was in open mm. rebellion. And the re I mean, mind you, these are people with nothing, with no weapons, with stones, going out to confront this army that had no compulsion about using live fire mm -hmm. to disperse crowds. And I thought, I have to see this. I have to document this for myself. And so that's what brought me p to Palestine. It was really to see this intifada and to tell the story and not from the perspective of a colonial media. So it wasn't overcoming Lebanon in that sense. It was something else. No, but I still ne I didn't return to Lebanon really yeah. until I made the film Beirut Photographer. And it's because I was, I kind of had survivor's guilt. You know, as a journalist, people always say, oh, you know, aren't you brave and courageous for going to these places? Well, yeah, in a certain sense, but I have the privilege of leaving when I want to leave, mm. you know, which is a privilege. Mm. Um, and I thought, I don't know, I just felt a terrible survivor's guilt about having, about leaving Lebanon. And I felt, I don't know, it, w it was, it was a, a big weight I carried. You know, I had nightmares for decades after that, still do. Um, and then when the anniversary of the 1982 war came, I was working for Al Jazeera making documentaries and they said, hey George, you know, you were in Beirut in 1982, why don't you make a film about it? So I said, okay, yeah, great, I'll do that. So it was roughly 35 years had passed, or less I guess, I'm doing my math wrong, 25 years. I'm a and <laughs> it was the 30th anniversary. The 30th anniversary, the 30th oh, right anniversary. in the middle, yeah. yeah. So 30 years later, uh, sorry, 25 years after you had left the country. Yeah. So a quarter century passes, and that's your first return, or your, your first real journey back to Lebanon. Yeah, I had come maybe once or twice just to dip my little toe in, but um, I hadn't really dealt with it psychologically. But can I, I'm, maybe I'm overstepping here, but you, you like this country, has long-term damaging effect, but yet you're going to cover the intifada. Is it that, it's not about, um, is it tragedy in itself or is it Lebanon that you couldn't come back to? Lebanon cut deeper for some reason. Mm. It cut deeper. Um, and I had the privilege during the war, unlike most photojournalists, because I, I carried an, an American passport I was able to travel back and forth mm. to both, you know, both, both sides, sides of the city, yeah. and and I was always struck by like the humanity of, you know, <laughs> the guys over here shooting and shelling the guys over there, and and likewise, yeah, and yeah. Uh, anyway, when they asked me if I wanted to come back to do a, s a film about the '82 war, I said, yeah, great. You know, you're not often offered a, you know, one hour on Al Jazeera to tell a story. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't really understand what that was all about. I don't, you know, I was there as a young yeah. person. I would see things explode and people running around, but I really didn't know the story of what was happening. And where do I begin to tell this story? And I, I thought, well, the, on, the only thing I really know are these photographs, which were etched in my brain. Yeah. And so I had the idea to come back here with those photographs and rather than me telling the story, have the p find the people in the pictures and have them tell the story. Right. Yeah. And I was really terrified that, you know, I thought people would be really angry at me because basically you're photographing them in the very worst moment of their life without their permission and you're broadcasting it to the world. But it's actually quite delightful to watch because a lot of, for the most part, they're actually quite pleased. They're saying, oh yeah, even a reference, oh, there's Arafat. Yeah. Almost like casually, like, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah. It's and that's, that was the shocking thing. Yeah. Rather than being angry at me or offended, they felt in some ways, I don't know, 
that I had v validated something terrible that they had gone through mm. and given them something tangible. Um, and that was very healing for me. That, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't reject me and reject what I had been doing all those years. So rather, they embraced it. That's quite interesting. So the personal, prob the personal pain is healed by knowing that your work is healing to others here. I think that's quite a nice way to reflect on this country when you return, and that you can now live here on your terms again. Um, I want to fast forward to your current work, but before that, it's. I hope I got this right. It's an Israeli bombing in the summer of 1981 that brings you closer to Beirut. You're not here immediately, but you sense that no one's covering a tragedy that kills hundreds in Beirut. And there's a way of offering some perspective in that had this been the other way around, everybody would be focusing on a Lebanese fighter jet or some other fighter jet hitting the Israelis. And actually, I was living in Berkeley at that time, which mm. is a big center of activism in the United States. And there were constantly demonstrations in solidarity with the Salvadorian people, mm. with the Nicaraguans, with South Africa. When this ap episode happened in Fakhani in Beirut, there was nothing. Right. There was nothing. Absolute silence. Yeah. And that's when I thought there's really something profoundly wrong here. And I thought the problem was information. You know, mm -hmm. I, I believed if people only knew, then they would care. But they don't know because it's it's absent from the Western press. It's absent, but then you find your way. It's quite a nice story in that you tag along with a friend through Europe on your way to Beirut, and you make it here. You make it before the Israeli invasion of Beirut. But the reason I'm emphasizing Israel here is that it almost sounds like this whole journey is being dictated by what the Israelis do. An Israeli bombing in Beirut takes you from being a student into a photojournalist. And I even remember the reference that you let go of your graduate school to do that. So even your academic future is paused and you're now in Beirut covering a war and suddenly you're a stringer for AP. This war drives you crazy to the point that you have to leave. The Israelis punishing the Palestinians, suddenly the Intifada. And you're going there to cover that story too. And I didn't mean crazy in a bad way, sorry, oh, I didn't I mean, you meant, uh, yeah, I meant it in the, you can't take this place any longer, but the Israelis in the West Bank and Gaza, and now you're covering that tragedy. You're covering other tragedies too, but it sounds like Israel is that sort of dominating force that's hurting you, hurting you personally, hurting this country devastatingly, but it's also defining your career. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and no, actually, I'll, I'll tell it is. I haven't really thought about it that way, but <laughs> I guess in some ways, you know, they have animated my career. Mm. Um, I was in Gaza working for the New York Times uh, in the early 2000s, and the newspaper industry was failing, and I thought I'd like to make a documentary film because satellite television started to, uh, to blossom all over the world. And so I began making a documentary film about how news gets from a place like Gaza to the front page of the New York Times. It was supposed to be a story about news gathering. And I thought, well, rather than making this a story about me, I'm going to make it about my driver, Raed, <laughs> who I, I owe everything to. Yet his name never appears on a story. He's, in terms of the hierarchy of news people, he's at the very bottom. But he was my driver, my bodyguard, you know, my fixer. Everything. So I decided to make a story about Rad. Yeah. In the middle of the film, or in the making of the film, I was waiting for Rad one morning, and six o'clock came, seven o'clock came, eight o'clock came. There was no word from him. I called him, I called him, I called him. He didn't answer. And I heard that he there had been a shelling in, in his village. So I jumped in a car, I raced there, and I found him crying on a stoop in a street entirely full of blood. And the Israelis had let loose 18 artillery shells, high explosive shells on his little village, killed 18 members of his family, wounded, 
really gravely, 36 other of others of them. And I continued filming. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, was to film your friend in the midst of a tragedy. But I was the only one, only person there. And it turned into a film called The Gaza Fixer. And it happened at the same time that Al Jazeera English was just launching. Mm. And so it was picked up by Witness. And it actually was sort of, it might have been one like the first awards that Al Jazeera English had ever won. So they said to me, well, that was pretty good. Why don't you make another one? <laughs> so <laughs> I made another film. <laughs> and then they said, well, that was not bad. Why don't you make another one? And so that incident, and I guess you're right, Israel, again, sort of launched my career in documentary filmmaking. I appreciate the journey and going through some of the darker chapters of this country's history, but also maybe your own life here. And I think it's clear that that did not dissuade you from returning on your terms later. And by 2012 or so, you're on the streets filming a return to Beirut. And then in recent years, you're lecturing about media, journalism, and more at AUB. And you're still a documentary filmmaker. Uh, I had the privilege of attending a screening of your most recent film, Woman Hold Up Half the Sky. I hope I remember that right. Woman Hold Up Half the Sky. Um, and it's a celebration, if that's the right word, of five women leading the post-blast recovery on the streets of Beirut, but not just one or two or three streets. It's a collection of neighborhoods. And it reflects the diversity of Beirut and it's not just Beirut. You go to Bebet Tebene in the north. I was actually delighted that something like a third cousin of mine, maybe a fourth <laughs> cousin, we got to know each other after the film, and we're like, oh, we're related by sheer fact that Bebet Tebene happens to be the, <laughs> the bond. But it's Muna uh, al it's Noor Kisirwene and her sister Miriam. There's music involved. Uh, it's others that, when I think of them, and their role in Beirut, I think of what you're describing in that resilience is, I think, a word that we can still use. And it hasn't damaged their commitment to the city, especially someone like Muna al She's actually next week's guest on this podcast. I've had her on my own podcast before. I think of her as a pillar in what we're talking about, that things get worse over time, and the celebration of collective memory and all that it, that word means, it's not easy to do when the tragedy goes on and on and on. But she's still involved, day in, day out. And I, I always like when these people meet. And seeing her on your in your film, it reminds me just how small Beirut is as well. But I want to go down the road of academia and maybe how you're able to offer your students some perspective on what you used to do and how they're covering this tragedy. Because I can only imagine somebody in your shoes who had to make that huge journey and sacrifice to Beirut and then witness the Israeli invasion, the summer of 1982, getting kidnapped, being a stringer for AP, experiencing the Intifada, covering endless tragedy. And you have students in your classroom with their silly smartphones showing you something they posted on Instagram and now they're a war correspondent. I can imagine that there's a bit of a disconnect <laughs> in the generations. So are you someone that can embrace the shifts in photojournalism, if that's the right way to describe it? Or are you maybe more conservative in that smartphones and activism online, if you will, or Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, that's not photojournalism. That's just a hobby, if you will. So anything you can kind of offer, and what it's like to teach younger students what you do? Well, well, first of all, there's a distinction between photography and photojournalism. There's many kinds of photography. Mm. You can be a commercial photographer, a wedding photographer. A photojournalist is a journalist that uses the camera to report news and to tell a story, or to, to document you know, uh, a social issue, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so what I do, I teach documentary photography and, and photojournalism to my students. And what's really fascinating to me is because I send them out on the streets to photograph the world around them, uh, 
how the work changes from year to year to year. Mm. So when I first started at AUB, the pictures were of, I don't know, midnight you know, dance clubs in Marmachael and people kissing in the streets and going to the beach and sort of the beautiful life. Mm. Then when the Thaura started, it became photographs of demonstrations and clashes and marches and tear gas and the ring. And then when COVID hit, <laughs> it became photographs looking out of the window of an apartment block at an empty street below right. and empty shops and you know pharmacies that had nothing on the shelf. Um, and so it's kind of gratifying to see them documenting their time because each time is unique. Mm. And a lot of times the things that draw you to photograph something aren't the same things that you find interesting looking at them y years ahead in hindsight. You know, so for example, I look at some of my photographs and the most interesting thing is the posters on the wall behind the person that I was taking a picture of. Oh, or the kind of clothes that they're wearing. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that's really gratifying and yeah, but photography changes, and the photography is unique among the arts in that it's intimately related to technology, and the kinds of photographs one takes are a direct reflection of the time that you live in and the technology available to you. So at the beginning of photography, everybody had, you know, in the pictures is standing yeah. still <laughs> like that because they couldn't move because the exposure was so long. Our grandparents. Yeah. Our great-grandparents. Then yeah. when you know, photography changed and you were able to take the camera off the tripod and there was roll film, they were all square format. And so, yeah, yeah. And so the aesthetic was a square format a aesthetic. In the days of film, that had its own aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You couldn't take a selfie unless, you know, you pointed the camera at a mirror, for example. <laughs> right, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Yeah, now, because people use iPhones, 90% of the pictures they take are with a wide angle lens, you know, because right. it comes with a wide angle lens and, and, and the format has changed. It's not horizontal necessarily exactly. all the time. More often than not, it's a vertical format. And it's social media friendly always. And it's social media friendly and it's easy, first of all. Yeah. And there are, there are more pictures taken in a day now than probably the entire <laughs> history of photography in the pre-digital era. Yeah, but none of them are printed out. Very rarely do people it's print true. a photograph. So you don't, it doesn't have the same tangible material quality mm -hmm. that it once did. For better or for worse, it's just different. But this, I like the distinction of photography versus photojournalism. And in a way, maybe one is looser in what you can do. But in terms of quality, I'm going to assume that a photojournalist today, today can get away with more things that you couldn't before. I mean, it's so much simpler. <laughs> yeah. Ways. I mean, or even they can be, they can brand themselves without working for a company. And then suddenly they can have a page that thousands oh, yeah. of people go to. I mean, when Saber and Shatila happened, there were only six photographers, <laughs> six cameras. Imagine you know, a historic massacre in a major world capital. And there were only six cameras. That's I mean, incredible. And it, I'm guessing you knew them as well. You knew yeah, the people I mean, behind the, yeah. Which meant as a photojournalist, you had a different kind of responsibility to the world than one mm. does now. Mm. I mean, when the Thaura was taking place, I could stay home and sleep and I, I didn't have to worry that, you know, <laughs> the world wouldn't know about this if I wasn't there. Right. Which is not to say that a trained photojournalist doesn't bring something special. I mean, the camera is to photography what the typewriter, you know, or word processor is to writing. It doesn't make you a writer. It makes the job easier. You don't have to use whiteout. You can go back and cut and paste and do things. But yeah, it it's the individual that brings you know the skill and personality and voice to the work. But I I somehow. It's the, yes, I agree with you, but the, the camera, our camera, our smartphone camera, I can never think of that as a, as progress to the camera that you held in Sabra Shatila. So there's something about quality going down. 
And social media to me doesn't seem to lend itself well to most things, including journalism. That photojournalism in itself is watered down, or it's the the becomes not. It's not that it's meaningless, but that it's it's everywhere all the time, and therefore it's not special. It's just background images online always. While that's true, and this is like to me ironic, even like in this time of 4K high def video, mm. a single image has a unique power to galvanize public opinion. And we saw in the picture of uh, the little Syrian boy that washed up on the beach, Adnan Kurdi. Yeah. That image had a real life tangible effect on German policy towards immigrants. And after it was published, there was such a, an outcry that Angela Merkel was moved you know, to loosen the regulations about allowing refugees into the country. Mm -hmm. That one image. I don't know why that image, but that you know, a single image can do that. It doesn't happen often. Mm -hmm. Napalm Girl is another one. Oh, this is exactly what I was thinking. But Napalm Girl showing up in newspapers or magazines versus today a photo that goes viral online. Do you sense that there's still that kind of weight today compared to... I mean, you can't compare social media to the press. Mm. It has a different function. Yeah. You know, it's a social function. The pictures you see on Instagram are beautiful, but they're aesthetic. They often don't have, you know, a yeah. message yeah, yeah. or something to say. I think it's the message. That's yeah. that's well said. Yeah. And so I think that's what, that's the disconnect that you're talking about is there's a lot of photography, but it's decorative, but largely meaningless. And forgettable. How do you but how do you convince the student then that wants to enter this world <laughs> that they have to they have to go through a um a journey that's not necessarily one that they want to. It's easy for them just to do what you're saying and I think it's not it's not for me I think it doesn't really work well in trying to communicate the message. So how I'm I guess in in your shoes what um is there a, are you are you conservative at all with current technology and social media? Do you encourage students to try the harder way to get a camera? I mean, <laughs> first of all, I, I, I yeah, I don't like uh, I don't like iPhone photography mm. generally speaking. I, I encourage them to have a real camera. Okay. And actually, having a real camera kind of empowers you, because when you're walking down, one of the big problems with doing photography in Lebanon is you can't do it freely. Oftentimes people will stop you. Why are you taking my picture? Then you get interrogated. There's a whole, you know, thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's not like going around Paris and snapping pictures. Right. You do that in Beirut, you'll, a cop is going to stop you. You know, somebody who considers themselves an authority is going to stop you. Yeah. I tried to take photos in Sanaya Park and they wouldn't let me take Someone photos. Someone comes in Sanaya <laughs> Park, for God's sakes, you know. Uh, <laughs> I got, you know, stopped by the cops because I was photographing Moore Tower from, you know, a, a, a kilometer away. And I said, for God's sakes, it's been there for 50 years. <laughs> and <laughs> like the whole city, you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> so there are restrictions. But when you have a real camera, it lends you a, a certain seriousness or can that allows you to, to do street photography. And so much of it actually isn't the camera or anything else. A lot of photography or this kind of photography relies on the social skills or the interpersonal skills of the photographer. Right. And so that's uh, something I talk about quite a bit. Well, that's interesting. So it's, how, it's how really how you're using the camera as opposed to the shot itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you make people feel comfortable around you? Yeah. You know, how do you go into a neighborhood where you don't know anybody and operate? And then when they see your camera, they're not uncomfortable. They're still... As long as you're not hiding it, I mean, they yeah. might not want to know what you're doing, mm. but you know that's where the skills of journalism come into right. into play. But I like you, you mentioned messaging earlier that it struck me at it's also the difference between a film like Women Hold Up Half the Sky. It's not. I mean, it's a 30, 40 minute story. There's a narrative arc. There's characters. There's a beginning, middle, and end. It's satisfying. It wants you wanting more, but it's it's just the right amount to cover. I think how five women help in a city's recovery, 
and it's completely on your terms. It could have been three women, it could have been 10, it could have been two men, two women. You decided to make it or emphasize a woman-led moment, and it's fantastic from start to finish. That compared to an Instagram reel, <laughs> where it's just taking your iPhone, talking to five women, and it goes viral, and maybe a million people see it. I still find your work more meaningful to me, but I think that's maybe being subjective. I appreciate the story, and I think storytelling, it's harder to do that with a smartphone. I think the patience and the dedication, you can't do it with an iPhone. You still have to have a craft. I mean, there's still craft involved. It's, it's important. And having something to say <laughs> is important. Having something to say. And knowing yeah. how, how, to, how to tell it in a narrative fashion that mm. is interesting and compelling. Right. You know, and not too long. <laughs> is that the message you communicate to your class? That you need to have something to say? Otherwise, it's just... Absolutely. Absolutely. Do they you get need it? To have a sense of composition. I mean, there are technical things: knowing composition, knowing lighting. I mean, nowadays with cameras, you can give a camera to a monkey, and with <laughs> autofocus and auto exposure, you know, it will come back with you know at least a few good pictures. A few that good selfies. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make the monkey a photographer, you know, because it, it does it accidentally. A photographer can go out and every time bring back something that which is worthwhile and decent and has mm. something to say. But um, in terms of attention span, do you feel like, and I, I don't mean, I'm not beating up on students here or the younger generation, but that the lure is to have something that's quick and accessible. Does that interrupt the craft? Mm. In other words, it's okay for this It changes movie. it, it changes it. So for example, if you were to put this film women hold up half the sky on social media. It would probably work better if it was broken down into five, you know, small pieces mm -hmm. rather than one large chunk. Yeah. Because of the, the format. But I would not, I mean, I'm, I'm being conservative. I've, I even heard that comment made during the screening that why isn't this applicable to social media? That, in, for me, it's the end of the world. I want to go and watch this movie. Actually, I'm glad I got to see it like it's a film. Almost like a cinema experience in an mm -hmm. auditorium with the widescreen, that's how it should be in my mind. Seeing it on my smartphone, I don't know if I would really appreciate it as much. And I guess the appreciation for the art or the, the, the work involved, I never think of a smartphone as, as really, I think of it as just easy and quick. It's almost like fast food. Yeah, and I mean the thing about cinema is that it's an experience. You enter a darkened room, it's almost like a dream. Yeah. It comes up on, on the screen. Yeah, you be should become immersed in the story so that you forget where you are. You're, you're in the story. It's it, that's a hard thing to do if you're looking at a you know, exactly your screen. Yeah, you know. So they just have different functions. I don't think it replaces cinema, but yeah, more and more. Um, it's kind of like looking at your photos up close. I'm I've I've. It's an honor for me. To have seen your work in your office compared to downloading your work online on Google Images, I, there's not, I can't compare that. Yeah, and I think it's the same way going to watch your movie with an audience, and the the characters are there too; they're literally in the room, versus being in my bed on my iPhone Mini and looking at it. I just I can't think of a photojournalist's work ever being fully respected in this current format. But I don't know if that's me being reluctant to embrace technology. I just don't care for it. Well, it's different, you know, and again, the thing about going to the cinema and seeing a documentary like that is it's a shared experience yeah. with the people around you. Mm -hmm. And it's just profoundly different than sitting in your bedroom and looking at something. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I mean. It's the effort that's not there too. I like going to visit your work and making that commitment. I, I think I appreciate it more. I want to go into something you mentioned earlier, and I think the phrase you alluded to was, was spot on. <clears throat> you, you had a moment in the 1980s when you're leaving this country that, uh, I'll use your words, that your pictures are not changing the world. And I think that's a, that's a very, uh, it's an honest sort of acknowledgement of severe limitation. I feel the same way. Everything I do, 
I feel it that it's not changing much. Even when people know about it, even when I know people listen, or people read what I write, or even people come now and attend my live podcast episodes, or whatever I do, I know that there's a huge audience in this country that is aware of it. But I don't think it's changing anything. And that is something I experienced last night with Zeven, talking about his work, his contribution, knowing it's limited, and knowing that it doesn't have that impact that maybe he thought it had earlier. And you acknowledge this too, yet you're still in this world. So I want to understand this. This kind of built-in acknowledgement, yet it's still your craft and you pursue it. Is that sort of a, I'm doing it because I love what I do and that's it? Or is there always that kind of maybe draw that perhaps it would have an impact maybe beyond my lifetime or maybe in places I don't expect or maybe not necessarily things you know about directly that happen indirectly. It could be somebody that knows your photography that you don't have any communication with and they re reinterpret their relationship. Maybe their prejudices fade, but it's not something you're aware of. H how do you kind of handle that? You know that you're not changing the world, yet you're still trying to change the world. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I think I've changed my expectation. Mm. Um, and nowadays, the way I think about it is like just planting a seed. And you don't know, you probably will never know if it made any difference, if it, if it affected someone. But I know in my life, for example, I, I picked up a book once walking down the street in New York that was <coughs> at a sale. It was $2 called Lido the Shoeshine Boy. And it was a very simple book. It was a first-person narrative about the life of a shoeshine boy in Honduras. And it really took you inside his world. I never look at a shoeshine boy the same way from now on. You know, there is a much greater empathy in my heart for them. Mm. The guy who did it has no idea I even saw the book. Right. <laughs> you know, to him, the book was probably a failure because it was <laughs> being sold on remainder. But it affected me. I mean, I still think about it 15 years later. Yeah. And I mean, so that's, that's kind of the hope. So it's planting seeds in places you don't even necessarily know about. Yeah. But they're planted. Yeah, and also, I don't know, for a photojournalist, a lot of it is just bearing witness to your time mm. and, you know, sharing that. So, like, with the women's film about uh, women hold up half the sky, it was my way of participating in the movement and celebrating these sort of local heroes that we have. Because we're, f I mean, we have a lo enough to be in despair about. And... Nobody needs you know, to be lectured about that or reminded about what a dysfunctional, upside-down country we live in. Yeah, but despite that, we have real heroes. Linda, your cousin, yeah. is a hero. She is a real hero. You know, she deserves to be honored. And hopefully, she'll inspire someone else. And so that was the hope, you know, that it could be sort of a salute to the collective womenhood of Lebanon. You know, I saw it as a salute to storytellers. And all of them, they have a story that they're sharing. They're, their own story is profound. And they're part of Beirut's story post-blessed in a way that's healing. But in particular, Munal Halla, I felt like it's almost like a tribute to everything she does and that she's still doing. And it's, it's I think, Maybe that's the kind of draw I have towards your work, is that I think of you as one of those most important storytellers for modern Lebanese history. And you did it in a way that impacted me. I'll tell you, I mean, I've told you this uh, the first time we recorded. I didn't know it was your photo of a child holding a photo of Martyrs Square before the Civil War, selling postcard-like photos in war-torn Martyrs Square. I remember that photo. I didn't know it was yours. And I think, yeah, I think my relationship to Martyrs Square is always going back to that kind of photo, this before and after. And even now, when I think of Martyrs Square and I think of everything that's happened in that part of Beirut, that photo, it lives with me. And that's what a storyteller can do. And I think 
you did it in ways that I cannot imagine. So for all those reasons and more, any discussion with you about Beirut is always a treat for me. I know I, um, I take advantage of this friendship by forcing you sometimes <laughs> to talk to me. Maybe you don't always want to, but for me, it's, it's an honor, it's a thrill. And anybody that's watching or listening, women hold up half the sky. Uh, check it out. And George Azar, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure for me too. Thank you. Thank you.